I'm Helen Christians and I'll be your MC this morning. Welcome to the Humanists of Greater Portland Sunday morning meeting. I want to welcome those folks who are joining us through Zoom and those attending in person at Friendly House. And uh, the Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American Humanists Association. Humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching primarily the primary importance to human experiences rather than supernatural beliefs. Humanists value the worth and goodness of all human beings and seek to find common values and respect among people. Humanists find amazing wonder in the natural world and stay curious and open as they seek natural, rational ways to solve problems through science, reason, and free inquiry. Our topic at today's meeting, Ben Franklin, Ken Burns, and the myth of meritocracy, especially addresses the humanist commitments of critical thinking and ethical development. HGP is an all volunteer group, 100%, 100% volunteer group that believes strongly in freedom of speech. But I Lauren Beauregard will be our reader this morning. L Lauren, please come in for the reading. Uh, I must say, I, I am so looking forward to this mm -hmm. morning's presentation. It's something that intensely interests me. Um, I was looking for a reading that was remotely relevant to the theme of this morning's talk. And I came across something that, um, it, it goes back to the year 1452. This is 40 years before Christopher Columbus discovered America. And this has to do with something that's known as the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery is, was proclaimed in 1452 and it was an international law that gave license to explorers to claim vacant land in the name of their sovereign. Vacant land was defined as land that was not populated by Christians. The doctrine of discovery is based on the idea that some people are superior to others based on religious, racial, ethnic, and cultural differences. These are the words used in the message of Pope Nicholas V to King Alfonso V of Portugal in 1452. Um, this is an excerpt from something that is known as a papal bull, no pun intended. <laughs> the quote is, invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and take away all their possessions and properties, unquote. The bull of 1452 was what set forth the so-called age of discovery, the idea was to exploit Africa and the Americas to obtain slaves and conquer lands in order to enrich the Catholic Church. In particular, the papal bull that was issued by Pope Alexander VI in 1493, that's one year after Columbus did his thing, played a central role in the Spanish conquest of the New World. It supported Spain's strategy to ensure its exclusive right to the lands that were discovered by Columbus in the previous year. This one, this bull, stated that any land that is not inhabited by Christians is available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited by Christian rulers. It declared that, quote, the Catholic faith be everywhere increased and spread, and that the barbarous nations should be overthrown and brought to the faith, unquote. Now, you might think this is ancient history, so to speak, but it actually, this doctrine of discovery lasted for quite a while. As late as 1823, the US Supreme Court held that the principle of discovery had given European nations an absolute right to new world lands. In essence, Native Americans, American Indians, had only the right to occupy the land that they were on, and even that could be abolished at any time. So that that's it for the reading. Lauren, thank Lauren, thank you so much that you really took time to find that, and I we all appreciate it. It goes perfectly with our presentation today. I would now like to welcome today's speaker. I think we're all anxious 
uh, to hear his presentation. Uh, Dr. Tim Messer Cruz received his PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin Madison and has served as professor of history and chair of, uh, at the University, University of Toledo and professor of ethic studies and chair of ethics studies uh, department at Bowling Green University where he, in Ohio, where he is uh, currently working. Uh, Dr. Messier Cruz is the author of six books. His most renowned uh, work boldly revised, long held interpretations of the famed Haymarket bombing in Chicago in 1886 and the anarchist movement behind it. His forthcoming work examines the 18th century white abolitionist movement using the methodology tools of critical race theory to uncover a deeper and unsettling truth about America's revolutionary foundation. foundations. America's founding generation dreamed of a nation without slavery, but also without black people. And this double imperative has indelibly scarred our basic institutions. He will be speaking today on Ben Franklin, Ken Burns, and the myth of meritocracy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mara Cruz. This is going to be a wonderful presentation we've all been looking forward to. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Helen. Really, uh, really honored to be here with you all this morning. And um, I'm happy to uh, share my, my work. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those rare pleasures for academics that we actually get to move out of the library and talk to real living people. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, it comes less often than you'd imagine. <laughs> so, um, yeah, today I, I, I want to talk about uh, the concept of meritocracy. I want to talk about Benjamin Franklin and Ken Burns and the way that this concept is in many ways being uh, re-articulated and re-ingrained in American popular culture. Um, and uh, I, I want to say I, I, I'm picking on Ken Burns, not because of any particular personal animus against Ken Burns, but because Ken Burns represents very much the national consensus about the American past. Uh, there's really no figure uh, alive today um, that, that really, I think, embodies what, what remains of any kind of a national consensus about our own history. Uh, we, are, we are, as you well know and well aware, we are becoming such a tribalistic and divided and ideologically driven society that um, it's very hard to find any common ground whatsoever. And I think uh, one thing that Ken Burns has done is that he has very much mapped out for us what common ground uh, seems to exist uh, for, for Americans in general in thinking about their past. So that's why I pick on him, <laughs> not because I, I, I really want to, uh, you know, engage in a debate with him, but but that I think that he represents something that that helps us understand something deeper about our own national character, if there is such a thing. So um, I want to begin by talking about uh, meritocracy as a, as a concept, and particularly as a concept that is now moved into front and center of our uh, identity conflicts and uh, uh, tribal cultural wars. And, uh, and then I want to uh, talk about the way that I think the image of Benjamin Franklin uh, is a good place to start thinking about some particular examples of what meritocracy means and the kind of cultural and uh, intellectual work that it actually does right now. Um, so that's, that's kind of my outline. And uh, I have to apologize. I will at times be reading some things. Um, partly that's because I want to make sure that I'm uh, being very uh, particular about the words that I choose. Um, but also it's, it's a certain degree of vanity. I think I like the way I write too. So I, I'm, I read some things too. Um, so, uh, but I'll, I'll try and, uh, I know it's, uh, it's more engaging to be, uh, extemporaneous. So I'll be switching back and forth between, uh, reading some prepared materials and, and making sort of a, a commentary. And then I very much look forward to having a, a dialogue and exchange with all of you, um, about these important concepts. So, so without further ado, let me let me begin. And I, I want to say that the advent of this work um, is, is very much uh, uh, somewhat recent. It really begins from uh, November of 2020 when President Trump uh, issued his executive order two weeks before the election, uh, the executive order titled Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. 
And this executive order then became the template for a whole series of state statutes, state laws that uh, censor and regulate and prohibit discussion of various concepts around race, racism, and so forth. Um, now, the, the, the executive order combating race and sex stereotyping prohibited any government agency, contractor, or even grant recipient from uh, teaching or, quote, inculcating, whatever that means, uh, their employees with any of nine what were called divisive concepts. Now, those nine concepts were uh, a, an interesting group. If you look at them, uh, let me, let me re reprise them quickly so we can see uh, how one concept among these nine kind of sticks out like 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 doesn't belong with the others. But um, so those nine concepts are first, um, and now, now let me remind you, these are concepts that are forbidden. These are prohibited. These are censored. We not legally able to talk about them uh, under this executive order and uh, not under the uh, 16 states now have passed state laws prohibiting the discussion of these concepts in public schools or in uh, entities that contract with the government. Uh, in the case of Florida, for example, it deals with government contractors. Um, and in other states, it just deals with public employees. It varies by state to state. But one interesting thing is that almost all of these 16 laws that have now been passed in the, in the last 18 months, um, pretty much all of them contain all nine of these so-called divisive concepts. So the first concept is one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. Uh, second is the United States is fundamentally racist or sexist. The third prohibited concept is an individual by virtue of his race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. Uh, another concept that's forbidden is an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his race or sex. Another is members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. Uh, another is an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. Uh, another is an individual by virtue of his or her race or sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. And then uh, another, which has been in the news quite a bit, and in, any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his race or sex. And then we come to number nine, the last one. Meritocracy or traits such as a hard work ethic are racist or sexist, or were created by a particular race to oppress another race. So that's divisive concept number nine. Now, um, I think if we look down that list of concepts, many of them on, on the face of it, I mean, just superficially, we would all say are solid humanistic values. For example, the, the idea that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex is, is of course condemnable in every situation. There's no, there's no situation in which that concept really should bear any validity or weight. So there are, there are things in this list, I think, which all of us would say to a degree, make sense that we support and so forth, maybe not support censoring them, but we would, I think most people of goodwill, thoughtful people, educated people, people who give some moments thought to these issues would agree with many of these concepts and say that they, they really are, 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 you know, just terrible concepts. They're wrong headed, they're, 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 they lead to bad outcomes. They, uh, they're, 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 they come from a source of hatred and, and uh, illiberal values. I think that, that, that there is that, and that in, in many ways is sort of the, the, the way that these, this whole legislative movement that's been created has been sold to the public, is that we're, we're not really censoring anything that anybody would wanna talk about. We're censoring values, which I think all of us would agree are terrible ideas, invalid ideas, wrong ideas, um, and therefore what's to, what's to argue about. Okay, here's one of the problems. Uh, and this is one of the problems that I see with this list is that in many ways, this list of nine divisive concepts is kind of a Trojan horse. 
um, it appears on the surface to be prohibiting ideas which most people would agree are wrong or vicious or mean or harmful. But in fact, some of the ways that these prohibitions are phrased actually reinforce the very ideas they purport to combat. For example, I mean, many of these ideas purport to combat racism. But in fact, when you unpack what's actually being prohibited and the way that these prohibitions are written, I would argue that they in fact reinforce racism. They actually create a, a legislative basis for racism. In particular, I wanna, I wanna really uh, probe today the prohibited divisive concept that is written, quote, meritocracy or traits such as a hard work ethic are racist or sexist or were created by a particular race to oppress another race. Okay, so at first glance, that seems like something that most people would probably ag agree with or think at least that that has some legitimacy. But, but when you really begin to think about what meritocracy as a concept is, and in particular, the way that this prohibition is written in terms of claiming that hard work ethic is a trait, which is a, a word that reflects or, or alludes to something being a natural inherited tendency. A trait is something that we tend to have uh, naturally, biologically, inherently part of our makeup, part of our essential character. Um, when we begin to think about meritocracy, which is the, the, the idea that our society is structurally established so as to reward talent and hard work, that those who get ahead in this society, those who become CEOs and college presidents and so forth, um, that they have somehow, they are being rewarded for their talent, their energy, their hard work, and that the rewards that they experience are somewhat commensurate with the contributions they make to society. And therefore the whole system is just, and the whole system is therefore defensible and perhaps even the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> well, um, I wanna look at this idea of meritocracy a bit more carefully. So um, what I wanna argue is that prohibiting criticism of the concept of meritocracy actually powerfully reinforces some of the worst, hardest versions of racism. Some of the most uh, uh, pernicious biological and essentialist ideas of racism are actually supported and defended when we prohibit the, the contemplation of the dynamics and the, and the reality of meritocracy. So let me point out that, that of the 16 state laws that have been passed, um, they, they all equate meritocracy with, quote, traits such as a hard work ethic. Um, I, sh I should just point out that uh, meritocracy is often misunderstood because it thinks that hard work is essential to a meritocracy. In fact, um, if you look at the, 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 the sort of the philosophical basis of meritocracy, a system that is based on raw talent, but laziness would also be meritocracy. So the hard work part of it is not necessarily uh, needed. But anyway, calling a hard work ethic a trait naturalizes the idea uh, of meritocracy. It basically enacts a form of social Darwinism in which the poor are lazy and deserve their poverty and the successful have earned their position in society and should be celebrated and rewarded. In this way, does the ascendant conservative ideology of today become part of the legal structure of the country, not just an ideology. Now, this is doubly problematic because in many ways, the concept of meritocracy um, requires us to really examine the essential basis of uh, reward or punishment in our society, economic reward or economic punishment. So the common way of thinking about poverty and opportun or opportunity um, uh, would, would, would be um, problematic um, in, in any case, but, but the meritocratic argument 
makes most theories of individual behavior very problematic. Um, let me illustrate. So um, if you believe in meritocracy, if you believe that those who have succeeded in this society have earned that success, either through talent or hard work, um, it's, 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 it's very easy to find examples of either, either those who succeed or those who don't. For example, um, you can always find some fault in the character of the poor. Um, you, you can always explain the source of the hardship of those who have not succeeded in society in something that's related to their own character or their own behavior. Now, of course, rich people also have faults, but we don't necessarily investigate those the same way as we investigate the poor. We're always investigating the poor for their character. We're rarely investigating the rich for their character. But the problem is that it is not just that individuals who are poor um, because they are ill or uneducated or drug addicted or criminal or unemployed. Um, it's not just that individuals might be able to be shown to have some character flaws in this way, but it is that whole communities can be labeled as having these social pathologies. Um, there are whole communities in our country that are more plagued by these problems than other communities. Um, there are groups of people that we identify as races or ethnicities that appear to be more prone to these problems than others. This is the problem. Americans like to believe that they live in a colorblind multicultural society. And in our enlightened age, most people reject the racist notions of the past, such as the idea that one race is inferior to another. Um, we are justly repelled at racist stereotypes um, or the idea that some races are more criminal than others or lazier than others or dumber than others. We don't like to admit to ourselves that we believe the color of someone's skin has any more meaning than the color of their eyes. The problem is, so how do we then explain the fact that people of culture, col color and communities of color are many, many times more likely to live in poverty than white folks? Um, why is it that that people of color are many times more likely to serve time in jail than white people are? Why is it that they're many times more likely to be unemployed than white people are? Um, people of color in America even have significantly shorter lifespans than white folks. Here it is. Americans can't have it both ways. They can't believe that they live both in a meritocracy where individual talent and effort determine success and also live in a colorblind society where race doesn't matter. Most people shy away from even thinking about these problems and thinking about these racial differences and economic disparities. And, and one way to avoid these ideas clashing in one's mind is not to think too long or hard about them. But the fact remains, either race explains these differences by allowing whites to rise over other groups because of their natural abilities, or America is not the land of colorblind equal opportunity that most people believe it to be. In other words, either race or racism explains the world we see around us. Um, so because today racism is unpopular, uncool, impolite, which by the way, it wasn't just a couple generations ago, um, few people would openly embrace the explanation that poverty, crime, or other social problems are the result of racial differences. But it is difficult to see how America could systematically hold back a vast group of people when there are no racial laws, private racial discrimination is outlawed, and the hateful racist attitudes of the past are, are largely overcome, if you look at public opinion surveys, for example. So how do we explain why race continues to be a very strong predictor of success or failure in a meritocratic America? How can we decide which factor, race or racism, is the root cause of American inequality? Most Americans would agree that the nation failed to live up to its principles of equality while it grew rich on slavery and the dispossession of native peoples. But when did the United States of America fulfill its promise of liberty for all? Was it when slavery was abolished with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in 1865? 
uh, or when racist Jim Crow laws were declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the 1950s? Or was it when Congress finally outlawed housing discrimination in 1968? Or was it when a black man was finally elected president in 2008? Or not yet? So one of the most common myths about the origins of economic inequality is that economic discrimination is only a system of exclusion. Most everyone, at least in public, now agrees that outright racial discrimination in hiring, promotion, compensation of individuals is wrong and should be prohibited. Few people, however, recognize that this is only one side of inequality. In America, where most businesses are privately owned, and most of these important decisions are, come down to the decision of a single individual, there is also the inequality that is produced by unfairly positive judgments. As one researcher put it recently, all that is necessary to maintain, if not create disparities in any number of outcomes, is for members of the dominant high status group to trust, cooperate, and work for the betterment of their in-group more than for out-groups. Um, likewise, uh, a survey of a thousand human resource managers across the US found that the most common quote unquote ethical problem in their organizations was the employment on the basis of favoritism. Best estimates are that about half of all job openings in America are filled without ever being advertised. Okay, this form of discrimination called in group favoritism is perhaps a more insidious force maintaining racial and sexual and other inequalities because it is less public than formal exclusion, often working through private social networks that lend their in-group members social advantages. Moreover, because many people historically privileged by racial or sex inequality have come to expect these advantages, they appear to them normal, even invisible and are not even perceived as anything other than deserved. Language and the thought patterns that language breeds encourages such perception because most common definitions of the words discrimination and prejudice point to negative bias and exclusion, not positive bias and ex excessive inclusion of others. Though both are equally invidious, equally discriminations, equally prejudicial. Uh, Recently, uh, essayist Tim Wise pointed out that the English language has words for being underprivileged, but not for being overprivileged, though one condition cannot exist without the other. And I should note that when I was typing this, my spell checker flagged the word overprivileged as an error. Um, so much, if not most, of the wealth disparity that can be seen today uh, was not the result of impersonal forces like the labor market or the ups and downs of the overall economy, nor was it mostly the result of individual acts of prejudice and discrimination. Rather, the great gulf was between the wealth of whites and people of color in America. And this was the direct result of conscious and deliberate public policies intended to increase the wealth of white families and to bypass all others. America's racial class structure in the 21st century is the result of more than a century of government welfare and public subsidies for whites that excluded the nation's black and brown citizens, though they had to pay for them through their taxes like everybody else. Um, so in this way, this concept of meritocracy reinforces the racist understanding of America as a place where people are responsible for their own failures. And in the case of communities of color, that responsibility is probably genetic. The, the, the drive to prohibit discussion of meritocracy is actually a covert drive to reinforce a naturalistic, biological, essentialistic idea of race and therefore strongly reinforces racism. Well, I also think this is happening on a cultural level too, because I see um, meritocracy as a concept becoming more and more culturally and socially acceptable, and perhaps even culturally and socially unquestioned, which I think is a, an important, important point that I'll, I'll come back to at the very end. And um, let me examine this through uh, Ken Burns's latest documentary. It, uh, it debuted uh, this spring, uh, titled 
simply Benjamin Franklin. And uh, I think in many ways, this, this uh, production uh, exemplifies uh, the lack of investigation and the lack of critical thinking about what meritocracy is and what it means in this country. So uh, let me read a little bit here. Um, so the belief that those occupying the pinnacle of wealth earned their riches through talent, grit, and hard work has served to justify inequality since Americans threw off their king. While other tenets of America's secular religion, manifest destiny, white supremacy, social Darwinism, have withered in their power to excuse capitalism's enforcement of poverty and the empowerment of wealth, our national faith in meritocracy endures. In fact, I think it's getting stronger. Americans have convinced themselves of the justness of their society by equating privilege with genius, skill, and perseverance, even in the face of the most glaring examples of arbitrary oppression. Gilded age robber barons looked upon their workers as congenital serfs and treated them accordingly. Henry Ford famously had a plaque on his desk that read, there is a seat for every ass. Even enslavers thought they had earned their mastery of others by dint of their intelligence, their moral righteousness, and their wisdom. Among the constellation of stories that Americans have told themselves in support of the myth of meritocracy, perhaps none has been as resilient as the tale of Benjamin Franklin, the runaway apprentice, the unschooled polymath, the canny inventor, the patriot, the writer of Poor Richard's Almanac, and its secularization of God's reward to the just. While the stars of other founders have tarnished as the stories of Sally Hemings, Ona Judge, and thousands of others abused by their patriot owners have come to light, old Ben has quietly persevered in his self-made fame. As though outranking all his compatriots whose images stare out from American currency isn't enough, Franklin's star has been given a Ken Burns polish. Burns's latest PBS documentary, simply titled Benjamin Franklin, is state television in its middle brow glory, a four hour lecture by an army of highly credentialed historians on the virtues and contradictions of the man who personified the self made man. As Burns gushed on the Today Show, quote, he's the most amazing American of the 18th century. You know, he's the greatest writer of the 18th century. He was a successful businessman. He's a printer, a publisher. He's the greatest diplomat in American history, a world-class inventor and a world-class scientist discovering the properties of electricity that we still use today. He basically creates the United States because without the French help that he got, that he negotiated, there is no victory by George Washington at Yorktown. So no him, no us. Burns wants to not only burnish Franklin and elevate him in the pantheon of founders, but to sell the idea of meritocracy. Early in the first episode, Burns's chief historical talking head, the former chief of CNN, Walter Isaacson, who wrote a best-selling biography of Franklin, intoned, quote, Franklin believed that the virtues and values of a working middle class were the, going to be the backbone of American society, unquote. From this idea grows the myth that American society ever actually embodied those ideas. Beneath the stentorian narration, camouflaged under the period score, predictably overfilled with harpsichords and snare drums and fifes, lurking behind the slow pans over heroic canvases, is a simple and disempowering message. Men like Franklin have earned the right to rule over you. Franklin's life story is presented as the personification of the idea of merit. Mr. Early to bed, early to rise, who willed himself into the center of a maelstrom that made the modern world. This celebration of the icon of go-getterness comes at the very moment when the wealth gap between the one percenters and everyone else is wider than it has ever been. When the cosmopolitan global elite and the vast national hoi polloi live in entirely different worlds, and as the governmental institutions that have long kept this powder keg from exploding seem to have lost their powers of self-preservation. Clearly, America is in need of a steroidal infusion of bootstrap pluck 
to rejuvenate its lost dreams and dying myths. Though long celebrated as the working man's founder, Franklin's story needs some careful set decorations to pass for what it claims to be. We need to overlook that the autodidact was tutored into the highly literate trade of printing by his older brother, or that he was repaid by running away before the fulfillment of his contract, his customary indenture. We shouldn't consider the fact that his brother did not sick bounty hunters after him or prosecute him in court as an unusually generous gift, essentially a rare loan forgiveness that gave Franklin his start. Nor should we inquire too deeply about the, boast, the boost Franklin received from a series of wealthy patrons, one who sent him to England to learn the most modern printing techniques, another to finance his first independent print shop. We are led to view the political perks he enjoyed, the state printing contract, the grants of Indian land, or a royal sinecure as deputy postmaster as rewards for his talent rather than arbitrary advantages. Most of all, we are discouraged from asking the most basic question of all. Can any man who owns other men and women and exploits their unpaid labor ever claim to be self-made? Uh, along those lines, I, I was uh, preparing for this this week, and I actually ran across a letter that Franklin wrote to his mother that I, I actually didn't include in the book that I've, I've written. Um, which I think reveals a lot about his relationship to slavery and his thinking about slavery. This is a letter he wrote to his mother when he was 44, his mother was 83. Seems that all the Franklins were long lived. Uh, and let me just, let me just read a little bit of the letter for you. Uh, honored mother, uh, we have received your kind letter of the second and are glad to hear you still enjoy such a measure of health, notwithstanding your great age. My leg, which you inquire after, is now quite well. I still keep those servants, but the man not in my own house. I have hired him out to the man who takes care of my Dutch printing office, and he agrees to keep him in victuals and clothes and to pay me a dollar a week for his work. His wife, since that affair, behaves exceedingly well, but we conclude to sell them both the first good opportunity, for we do not like Negro servants. That's Benjamin Franklin writing to his mother in 1750. Um, clearly, his relationship to slavery was one of profit and exploitation. It was also one in which uh, the people who were, the, the men and women who were enslaved and served him were factors that he could discard or obtain as needed. Um, it's not clear from the historical record if when he sold this man and woman who, who were, who were a couple, whether he kept them together or whether he separated them, we do not know. Um, in any event, uh, these questions about claiming that a slave owner is a self-made man, is the first American, is the original middle-class person, is somehow the exemplar of American pluck and uh, bootstrap grit, is highly questionable. So Burns's clever construction of Franklin's life is doubly effective because it doesn't seek to hide any of these facts, by the way. Burns is careful to, as he put it, portray Franklin warts and all. Rather, immediately following each brief exposure of one of these pustules, Burns's army of historians march in to explain why what we just heard is not important and is outweighed by the next glorious achievement. Doubts are thus entombed in a shallow grave of patriotic affirmation, which Burns likely knows will be plowed over by the willing confirmation bias of his nationalistic audience. Burns' genius for showing just enough contrary facts to bolster the legitimacy of his overwhelming reaffirmation of conventional prejudices has been the formula that has won him a fortune in corporate sponsorships. General Motors, the firm whose CEO once explained that what was good for GM was good for America, bankrolled dozens of Burns's productions over a nearly two dozen year span. Even uh, Koch Industries thought Burns safe enough to sponsor his documentary on the Vietnam War of all things. Burns's current sponsor, Bank of America, has a clear interest in shoring up the public's faith 
in the justice of our economic system. It's advertisement that runs at the beginning of each of these Ken Burns, Benjamin Franklin episodes weirdly exploits images of two martyrs to American white supremacy. Billie Holiday, whose sufferings in Jim Crow America were voiced in the haunting verses of Strange Fruit, and the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., whose poor people's crusade was murdered with him. In the ad, a nervous black woman in a smoky club tries to gather her courage to begin a song when she envisions the ghost of Billie Holiday cut to a young black scholar running to his college class who hesitates at the door, but hears the ghostly voice of the Reverend King giving a speech. As they both seize their opportunities and triumph, the voiceover asks, can looking back push us forward? Can our past inspire our future? Bank of America proudly supports Ken Burns and the stories from our past that help us move forward. Now, the spectral image of Holiday appears without sound, so it can't be determined what she was singing. But the clip of King, for the clip of King, Bank of America oddly chose a snippet from a speech whose full text can be located, King's 1967 Three Evils speech. Did anyone at the bank read that full speech, read King's full remarks? Because in that speech, King says the following. We are the dreamers of a dream that the dark yesterdays of man's inhumanity to man would soon be transformed into bright tomorrows of justice. Now it is hard to escape the disillusionment and betrayal. Our hopes have been blasted and our dreams have been shattered. What happens to a dream deferred? It leads to bewildering frustration and corroding bitterness. Naturally, Bank of America would like us not to look back at the fact that one of its predecessor banks was founded by a slave trader, John Brown of Providence, Rhode Island, or that at least two of its other ancestor banks loaned money on the collateral of enslaved people. Better for us all to forget such deviations from the true spirit of America in our swelling pride for Benjamin Franklin. Even more weirdly, many of Burns's other sponsors represent the very antithesis of meritocracy. They are foundations, banks, and consulting firms whose business is sheltering the wealth of the wealthiest from taxation and conveying it to their undeserving children with the least financial friction possible. Burns organized a coterie of well-heeled donors who call themselves the Better Angels Society, presumably after the phrase Lincoln uttered in his first inaugural address, in desperate appeal to avoid a war. Among these modern angels is CEO of a consulting firm that, quote, helps clients navigate the political landscape in order to launch, develop, and manage family foundations, unquote. Another is a, quote, private wealth manager who pitches to the elite, quote, estate planning is ensuring that the legacy you've created helps the people and organizations closest to you reach their dreams even after you're gone, maximizing the financial benefit to your heirs, unquote. Another angel is a private family foundation that manages a fortune accumulated a century ago that frankly states that its mission is to, quote, create long-term wealth for the family by making selective investments into operating businesses and real estate ventures, unquote. Another is the great granddaughter of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Burns promoted his documentary in a televised forum at Georgetown University featuring former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who now serves on the board of McKenna Capital Management. McKenna Capital Management highlights the firm's emphasis on, quote, helping high net worth families preserve their families' long-term wealth preservation, unquote and to, quote, preserve and grow capital for multiple future generations, unquote. Even while describing their businesses as funneling inherited wealth to the children of capitalists, Bacana Capitalist Capital nestles its pitch in the comforting rhetoric of hard work and earned reward. Get this, quote, McKenna's investment expertise is a powerful complement to the family's drive and determination, which are essential to achieve such levels of success. Unquote. Such efforts of the owners of America to pass their property and power on to their children 
has been highly successful and seems to be becoming more and more seamless. 40 years ago, the economists Kotlikoff and Summers calculated that the private transfers of wealth across generations account for at least 80% of the total wealth in America. Now, since Kotlikoff and Summers made that calculation, economists and econometricians have been fighting over the actual number, but recently they've kind of settled that it's at least 60%, which means, in other words, that a majority of the wealth in this country is transferred by inheritance and not earned. Not surprisingly, those born in the highest quintile of wealth are more likely to stay in their class than those born in lower ranks that seem to churn more between each other. More recently, scholars have considered data that showed that as economic inequality between classes increases, as it is today, uh, mobility upward or downward across generations declines in total, a negative correlation that has been labeled the Great Gatsby Curve. Um, such trends represent a potential crisis in public acceptance of this economic system. All the more important for such cultural work as reburnishing the image of Benjamin Franklin and setting him up as an example of the self-made person uh, to do. So Burns's contribution to the reinvigoration of our most important capitalist myth is the soft power accomplice to the GOP's hard power attempt to outlaw criticism of the idea of meritocracy. Um, ben Franklin is Ken Burns' answer to his corporate sponsor's question. Can our past inspire our future? Apparently it can, as long as slavery recedes into the historical myths as the nation's original sin, and what remains is, clean, is, is, is the cleansed jewel of capitalism, the fulfillment of the nation's promise, and the best of all possible worlds. All right, well, that's what I got, and I'm happy to talk about any of those things with uh, all of you and, uh, and to know what you think. So thank you very much. Uh, just a Renga sends a lovely compliment. I'm amazed such powerful language, eludicating such an important and topic, elucidating, I've got my expert right here, uh, <laughs> uh, such an important and topical issue. Uh, Roy at Friendly House has a question. So Roy, come on in. Um, my son just came back from uh, uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina and uh, he had traveled uh, all over South America, but he was struck by Argentina because it was uh, more white than Portland. Mm. And um, he asked uh, about the uh, statistics, you know, on ethics uh, groups. And he found out, you know, certain percentage, most of them were Italian and, uh, and then the rest were German, I guess. But, uh, what what struck me was that they have a law there about um, uh, publishing the statistics on the, on the, uh, the the races of various people, uh, and um, I thought that was kind of strange. But now it seems kind of clear uh, that they didn't want to uh, to see the that. W some groups are disappearing while others are increasing. Mm -hmm. So they, they prohibit the release of statistics on, yes. on yes. racial demographics. And yes, and I looked right. it up on Wikipedia and then they, they agreed that the, the CIA made an effort to try to find out. But other than that, uh, it's, it, it seemed like an unimportant question. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting parallel with what's going on now with uh, the GOP's mania for outlawing these divisive concepts. So uh, some of the interpretations of these laws would uh, make it very difficult for school systems to report their racial demographics. Um, so uh, some of these some of these laws will actually uh, mask uh, the actual sociological and demographic and economic effects of our policies by making it hard for school districts or even entire states to collect demographic data by race, which is very interesting because the, the education department of America, the federal education department has only been collecting school data broken down by race and ethnicity since 2001 because a Republican president by the name of George W. Bush signed the 
uh, No Child Left Behind Act, and re that act requires it. So now we have an interesting situation where the GOP is actually mm -hmm. fighting against its own legal legacies. Um, that's how far we've gone. Wow. Al Christians has a question. He's sitting here beside me. Go ahead. Yes, you said that it, you know you, the concept of self-made man is uh, it's applicable to Franklin because he wrote the story. It, you know, he was his own PR guy. The the stuff about his his uh, hard work when he was a kid is in his autobiography. He wrote that well, I believe when he went to France to sell himself to the French. Mm -hmm. uh, but coincidentally, uh, Billy Holiday's uh, autobiography alleged autobiography, I don't know who wrote it for, uh, is pretty, pretty much uh, not fact based as well that we've got. America is a country of people, you know, that Franklin had the had the had the same problems as most of the other people in the society he lived with. I'm surprised you didn't mention his one uh, real example of of a very biased writing against a particular group, though, which it was he, he published some piece that was considerably anti-German. It was it would be like Trump writing about the the Latino immigrants to the United States, but he was writing about the German immigrants to the to Pennsylvania. Right. Well, and that also illustrates that he had a very different idea of what white people were. So uh, in in the in the eighteenth century, whiteness was pretty much restricted to uh, Anglo-Saxon English speaking Christians. And uh, so he was not quite sure that Germans uh, belonged in that group. Uh, he was dubious. Uh, he, he will later in life come to embrace uh, sort of a pan-European sense of whiteness, which, uh, which was expanding, uh, moving into the uh, 19th century. But it's interesting because you can chart from Franklin's own writings um, how this concept of whiteness itself uh, is historically invented, historically created, and historically changed over time. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, he was he was dubious about the Germans. Interesting. Thank you. Lauren, come on on. You have a question. I think that I saw a reference to Ken Burns as com comparing himself to an epic poet. Uh, like, for example, the way he, he did his Vietnam documentary, he said he wasn't so much concerned to be recording history as to be telling a story in, in, in the way in which Homer does in the Odyssey. And it occurred to me that if that's what he's really doing and he wanted to be completely straightforward about what he was doing, he would open up the documentary about Benjamin Franklin in the same way that Homer opens up the Odyssey and it would go like, sing in me, O muse of the man of many ways. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I wonder, Excellent. I wonder if you would comment further on this way that Ken Burns has in various documentaries that he's done of putting forth his subject matter warts and all, and yet coming out seeming to have just done a very balanced presentation, and yet it comes out that American exceptionalism is given a 10. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I've written previously about how I think this is related to a uh, psychological theory that was developed in the 1950s by um, many of our defense agencies during the Cold War, um, who funded a lot of uh, study into propaganda and the development of ideologies, because they were very interested in countering propaganda by having propaganda of their own. <laughs> and um, uh, one of the things that psychological researchers came up with was the, the interesting insight that uh, propaganda tends to be much more believed if it doesn't try and hide the truth, mm -hmm. that the most effective propaganda is one that admits some counter information. Like it doesn't just present one side, but but it purports and appears to be balanced and presenting both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, I call this, uh, well, I didn't call this actually, the, these the psychologists who developed this um, called this uh, opinion inoculation. So mm -hmm. you, you give them a little bit of the counter evidence to your argument, 
you give the, the recipient a little bit of the counter evidence to your argument, and they will believe your argument more fully than if you hadn't mentioned that, especially because if they encounter that counter evidence on their own, then it seems to pull the props out from your entire argument. But if you've inoculated them, they, they're familiar with it, and it doesn't surprise them anymore to hear that. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, and I don't know if this is conscious or unconscious, but it is a formula that works very powerfully. And the formula leads to sort of a, a consensus, conventional acceptance of these documentaries and these interpretations of the past. And, um, and I think that's been one of the, one of the keys to, to Burns is that um, no one walks away from those documentaries feeling like they've gotten only one side of an argument. They always feel like there's countervailing evidence because yeah. he will often have different experts off, offering different point and counterpoint. And so it feels like you're getting a full rehearsal of all the possibilities, but in fact, you're not because you're being led down the path to a certain conclusion. There's always a point that you're yes. being led to. And the last person who gets to speak, the last expert who tells you what to think is what you're left thinking. <laughs> and that's all by design. Dave DiNucci has a question from Friendly House. Um, I've, thank you very much for this. Um, I've been following uh, a kind of a trio of academics. Uh, there's uh, Coleman Hughes and Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter. Uh, they're, they're all black, uh, highly educated academics who have, um, some people call them conservatives, they don't like that term to describe themselves. Uh, but what they do is push back significantly against the Black Lives Matter and, and various moves like that. Um, and they do so with, with facts to, the, to a large degree. I mean, they, they cite uh, statist, uh, valid statistics and, and do, do much investigation. Um, one of their arguments is that uh, the Black community is suffering from lowered expectations, that, that much of the, uh, many of the uh, anti-discriminatory laws and stuff go too far and they kind of end up coddling um, uh, blacks and other people in in tough circumstances and not not expecting much of them not pushing them up and not bringing them and of course these three people have already experienced success in their lines of uh, whatever I mean they they they're all published uh, publishing from you know Yale and and other you know Ivy League institutions etc um, it's it's very um, uh, someone like me almost, uh, you know, likes to listen to them and say, oh, yes, look at, I mean, you know, we've, we've definitely made great progress that these people would actually be, you know, carrying this line uh, forward. But at the same time, I, I need to constantly put myself in the fact that, well, they've already achieved their success, they've already, you know, shown whatever, and now in a sense, they're arguing that, you know, they got to where they are through these, through this meritocracy, et cetera. I was wondering what kind of uh, comments you might have on that. Sure. Well, this goes all the way back to uh, some of the theories put forward by uh, Congressman and uh, scholar uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan back in the 1960s and the development of this idea of a culture of poverty. Um, the idea that uh, what was holding people of color back from economic success in this country is uh, their, their own limited ambitions, their own uh, feeling that there's uh, no, no use in things like education, these, these disempowering messages that liberals have given them or that liberal programs convey. Um, this, this theory uh, is, is long lived at this point. I mean, it's as old as I am now. <laughs> And uh, it, it, you know, it's a really just another variation of blaming the victim. It's blaming the victim culturally as opposed to blaming them in other ways. Um, and it's, it, it's simultaneously blaming and excusing them for, for, for their poverty. Um, the problem is that whatever possible effect there is in terms of uh, disincentivizing or disempowering people in poverty from from grasping for that first rung of the ladder uh, is, is far, far eclipsed 
and uh, of little significance compared to the much greater cultural problem of white people valuing uh, the, 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 the contributions and actions of other white people over others. Yeah. Um, the, the insidious uh, uh, racism of simple overvaluation of, of white uh, achievements and white attributes and white talents, which by the way, uh, has been probably the, one of the most documented things in the world of social psychology um, in terms of double blind experiments between uh, job applicants or uh, renters seeking housing or police stops, stop and frisk, um, the, 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 the treatment of, uh, of, of customers to waiters and, and, and servers. Um, there, there's been literally hundreds of studies that all line up in the same direction, that uh, there, there is a, a fundamental uh, uh, phenomenon of uh, white folks overvaluing the, the work and the talents and the, and, the, and the behavior of other white folks. Yes. Now you put that alongside whatever sort of disincentivizing there might be for those in poverty. And it, it's, it, it, there's no comparison to the, the, the social power of that and, and the, uh, the ceiling that that puts upon uh, the, the possible achievements of people. Um, the, there's, the, that's just one problem, I think, with, with, uh, with, with that sort of an analysis. I mean, by the way, this analysis, you can actually trace it farther than, than, than the Patrick Moynihan cultural poverty thesis. You can trace it all the way back to uh, actually W.E.B. Du Bois and the, the idea of the talented 10th, if you want to go back to the 19th century. Um, there's, there's always been some system validating ideologies within the Black community as well. And uh, this is one of them. Now, now, are all of their arguments to be discarded? I don't think so. I think there's there's some validity in some of these some of these critiques. Um, for example, I think there's some validity in the critique of uh, quota based affirmative action as stigmatizing the work and the talent of of people of color. There's some validity in that. But again, whatever validity there is in 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 those in those problems are are far outweighed by the larger problem of the uh, largely unconscious overvaluing of, of white people's uh, experience and, and, and work histories and talents uh, compared to people of color. And, uh, you know, that's really the problem that needs to get, to get addressed, uh, as well as the structural problems we haven't even talked about, because one of the problems, I think, with, with some of the conservative arguments um, against uh, something like Black Lives Matter is that they they deny the reality of any kind of structural element to uh, racist or, or racist outcomes, and um, and that's that I think is is really difficult to to try and maintain. Uh, Robert Sanford has a couple of comments, and I'm just going to read read them, put them together. But as a former teacher, Robert's a former teacher, a high school teacher. No child left behind should be re retitled. No teacher left standing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that, right, especially the subsidy for charter schools and so forth, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then his second comment, in the late 1950s, the American Legion et al. got school boards to mandate that social studies teachers show the film Communism on the map in their classes. It was a John Birch Society view of the world, and some of the braver teachers I taught with, this was Robert's uh, taught with, uh, did show it but then pointed out its use of propaganda techniques the film used, so debunking the twisting mess, the twisted message of the film. So I think, I mean, just Robert's, the, the importance of teachers right now and what they're going through is what I think he'd like you to talk about a little bit. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a really good analogy, what, what happened in the Cold War period, the McCarthyistic period. Um, but, but I, I wanna point out something that I think is different today and in, in some ways even more stressful for teachers. And that is that um, in the past, when school boards have mandated various patriotic activities, whether it was saying the Pledge of Allegiance or flying the flag or looking at this weird John Birch Society film, 
um, there, there was no attempt to present those regulations as being uh, neutral. They were, they were always presented as the purpose of doing this is to build patriotism. And we understand that these are patriotic activities, nationalistic activities, and we want you to do them because we think students should be action, you know, exposed to them. They didn't, they didn't present them and say, present these because they're the truth. Present these because they are non-controversial. Present these because they cannot be argued with. Today, what's happening in these new anti-CRT laws around the country is that their sponsors and proponents actually present them as being the unvarnished, unarguable, absolute truth. And, and, and that, I think, creates a new situation for educators because you can't even point to it and say, look at this ideological apparatus that, that I have to present to my students. Instead, it's how do, you, how do you argue with something that's presented to you as being the absolute unarguable truth? It's it, even debate and discussion of it is banned. Um, and, it's, and it's banned on the basis that it is the truth. It, for example, if you look at, at the, some of these 16 states, not all of them, but about half of them have banned use of the 1619 project in the classroom, the New York Times, that, that radical communist publication um, project for educators talking about the importance of slavery in the American experience and the development of American institutions. That is banned. Why is it banned? It's not banned because it's unpatriotic. It's not banned because it's banned, they say, because it's untrue, uh, which is, I don't have time to go into the nuts and bolts of the 1619 project, but I can just say as a practicing historian of the 18th century, uh, you cannot argue that it's untrue <laughs> categorically. I mean, there are certainly aspects of it that are well, well documented and well, well established. There are aspects of it that are documented, but perhaps arguable. Um, there, there, are, there are areas of debate, um, even in the areas that are documented. But you can't argue that it's untrue. You can't argue that there's no reality behind it. And that's what's happening now with the, with the GOP's anti-CRT movement. They are claiming the, 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 the ground of absolute truth which is very dangerous and, and very difficult to work around because um, you know, the, the, anybody who, 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 who fights with truth and reality, they're not unpatriotic, they're insane. Um, so, so we've taken this up to a level that's really hard to argue with. I'm very fond of uh, the work of a mythologist named Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. He says the third function of mythology is to justify the society of which it's a part. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the kind of mythology as I think back was, well, it's this way because God made it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the current one uh, is sort of some version of social Darwinism, uh, but um, how, how could we, you know, is there, is there, where is the, where is the issue? There could be ideals that are put forward towards which a society could aim without claiming they've already been achieved. But on the other hand, if, if it's the nature of mythologies to justify what already is, what's, what's going on, how does that, how could, we, how could we address that kind of competition without confusing the ideals toward which we might move as being already attained? Mm -hmm. No, that's that's an excellent point, um, and I think what you you put your finger on is is the really important power of cultural struggle. You know, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the real struggle is uh, political because we we can see the outcome of it. But I would argue that in fact, 
some of the most important work to be done in social change is actually cultural, not, not political. And we can see this in just the point you're making. There's two ways of thinking about system justification. There's the conservative denial of reality way where we just assert that the system is just in face of all evidence, which is our current way. And then there's the aspirational way where you can say, we all share these values. We haven't attained them. We're working toward them. Help us work together. And let's work for that better world that we envision. Um, you know, the, the funny thing is that I think that's what the founders were doing too. You know, I, 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 I think when Thomas Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal, he knew damn well that he was not living in a just and equal society. Uh, in fact, he wrote those words as his slave was serving him tea. How could he not? Um, but I think he understood the power of the aspirational idea. He understood the power of getting people to think in the future, to think of their, to think of their world not as the world that it is, but of the world that can be. And once you get enough people thinking about the world that can be, well, something funny happens. The world changes. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, I think we're in a period where we don't have a lot of that future thinking. We don't have a lot of that aspirational thinking. We have a lot of defensive, system-justifying, excuse-making thinking. And we need more visionaries. We need more people who are thinking about and can, and can convey to the rest of us why we should embrace this new world and what values are we carrying forward and what values do we all share. Um, you know, when the word meritocracy was coined in the 1950s, um, one of the people who, who coined the term, uh, the great cultural Marxist uh, Raymond Williams, he said, uh, you know, the problem with meritocracy is that it's based on this idea of a ladder of success. And only one person can go up a ladder at a time. And we need to start thinking about the ways that we can all have a ladder. How, how can we share a ladder? How can you remake the ladder so it's not an individual achievement, so it's something that all of us can be a part of? Um, and, and that interesting insight, from the that was from 1958, when Raymond Williams wrote that, as he was reviewing the, uh, the book by Michael Young, uh, which was the, the book that coined the word meritocracy. At the very beginning of thinking about meritocracy, there was this counterthinking about how meritocracy fundamentally destroys the idea of solidarity, fundamentally destroys the idea of communal activity and communal benefit. And, um, and, and I think that's something that we should really rethink and, and, and keep in our arsenal of, of, uh, of, of criticisms of this concept of meritocracy that um, I don't wanna live in a world that's just me. You know, I, I, I wanna well, live in a world that's us. If, if I hear you, correctly, maybe, um, the, the problem with the idea of meritocracy is that it's individual and not collective, if you can cleanse that words of all the other associations, so that there are some ways of living that work better for the people who are living that way than others, but not individually as in groups. Um, again, I. I don't want to take too much time because there's probably other questions, but it, it does seem to me that perhaps, perhaps a mythology that would be helpful is that too much advantage for your children is not good for them. Or uh, we should work toward, towards a society where all children are advantaged, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, actually uh, Michael Young, who was one of the founders of, or he coined the word meritocracy, by the way. Um, he wrote an op-ed in, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, in which he talked about how uh, meritocracy is both right and wrong, in the sense that, yes, we do have a society in which we have a system of education, in which if you are exposed to the upper levels of that education, if you, if you have the somehow the wherewithal to go through four years of Ivy League education. Um, yes, you will emerge with certain skills, talents, aptitudes um, that make you more marketable in our society. 100%, no question. That's, that's the way the system works. 
why have we built a system where only 1% can do that? Uh, you know, we could easily build a system where that benefit of education is much more generally available. And, uh, you know, the dirty secret is that it's not because we, we know what makes for a good education. Small class sizes, not overworked teachers, good resources. Um, and, you know, we don't we only provide that to the one percent. Uh, we've got a time for one last question. I'm going to ask Joyce to come in and uh, ask her question, please. And then, well, in a way, I, I think uh, you've begun to answer my question already, but it seems to, right now that the populists are very taken with the idea that we need to have a positive pers perspective on ourselves. We need to accentuate the things that we are doing right, and we're doing all these things right. Let's not talk about what we're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And perhaps a problem with the Democrats is, is that we're willing to admit that we have faults and that we have to work to improve on those faults. So uh, what I was wondering, if there's a way to accentuate what Hank is bringing out as kind of the aspirational Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, but I think you may be answering that question that there are, we, somehow the Democrats have to overcome that sense of we're only the negative party, you know, we're working mm -hmm. against, we're, we're just helping because we're, we're bad all the way through and we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think the Democrats are not very different from the Republicans in terms of their support and embrace of meritocracy. I think they, they what, what, essentially the, the only partisan argument about whether America is a meritocracy is that the Democrats say we can make meritocracy work better. Mm -hmm. um, we're better. We're better administrators. We're better. We're, we're smarter people. We'll make we'll, we'll grease the system so that it works better for everybody. But it's still the same system. <laughs> it's still this individualistic system of private success. Um, and and they have not they have not gone beyond that. That that's essentially still their vision of America. I think that's that's one of the real problems is that we have a two party consensus uh, on a on an idea of system justification, and uh, you know one party is uh, weaponizing that, uh, and the other party is uh, kind of soft pedaling that. But they both they both basically believe it. But how and do advocate you, it? How do you do that without opening yourself to the total nonsense of a communistic socialistic society. Ah, we wouldn't want that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I'll, you know, I, primarily as a historian, I can look back and just, just observe that, you know, uh, some ideas do capture people mm -hmm. and some ideas have great resonance at certain moments. You know, some, sometimes the right idea and the right leader of that idea intersects with the right historical moment and can can remake the world right. um now I, I sound like an idealist there i sound like i think I, ideas are the prime mover of history i don't i, I I'm, I'm not going that far in, into uh, idealism but i uh i do believe they're very very important and very very powerful and i and i and i think that uh we just uh we're at a moment right now where we we are a little bereft of ideas i think and um we 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 we're waiting for 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 better ones, uh, and for advocates of the better ones. Um, so so we'll see. I mean, in some ways, I think we are we are creating the material forces for a better discussion. I mean, for all the faults of social media, it does empower p people um, to to speak with one another in 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 forums that haven't existed before, and I think that's very exciting. And, and yes, I, I see that it's mostly being abused right now. It's mostly leading us down into the tribalistic rabbit hole, but it doesn't need to be that way. And it could turn on a dime. Uh, it's just it's just a tool that can be used in different ways. And right now, I, I'd say that, you know, it's being used. It's a, it's a hammer being used to pull the nails up as opposed to drive them in. And um, but but it could be the other way around. Uh, I hope to live long enough to see it. <laughs>